Chapter 1, The Dragon Feather At 5.14 a.m., the Dragon Feather, a cargo freighter out of Hong Kong, was on a straight approach course into New York Harbor. The Port Authority had given its clearance and the engines were at one-quarter cruising speed as it eased into port. It had been an uneventful voyage. Captain Lou Wan looked forward to a smooth docking and a restful week in New York before setting off back to sea. After six weeks of ship's rations, he was especially looking forward to nice dim sum in Chinatown with his cousin Chang. Now he sipped the dregs of his morning tea as he looked out at the pre-dawn silhouette of the Manhattan skyline. He felt completely at peace. But then the war pact arrived and hell was in season. They came by speedboat in the pre-dawn darkness, ten mercenaries dressed in black and armed with automatic assault weapons. With practice efficiency, they moored their craft to the dragon feather and silently repelled up the sides of the freighter. One of them disabled the ship's communication systems. The others rounded up the crew and marched them down to the cargo hold. It was all very quick and very efficient. They had to be. They had roughly a half an hour before the ship reached the pier. Now, Captain Lou Wan felt back tears of anger. He and his crew were on their knees, guns aimed at their heads. It would not be a good time to lose his temper. Well, Captain, hmm. I assume you do understand English and that you do have a name. The captain looked up at the war pack leader. I am Captain Lu Wan. Pleased to meet you, Captain Lu Wan. My name is Malice. My crew and I will not give you any trouble, the captain said. A quick glance at his crew told him that this assurance did nothing to calm their fears. What we want is simple, Captain. We want access to the stone coffin of the warlord Sage. At first, Captain Lu Wan thought he had simply imagined what the war pack leader said. Yes, he knew from the ship's manifest that the large crate in the security vault was an archaeological artifact, and yes, it might possibly be an ancient coffin, but the legendary stone coffin of the warlord Sage? Ridiculous. No, that is not possible. The warlord Sage is only an old Chinese folk tale. My grandfather told me the story many times. It cannot be sage in that coffin. Frankly, Captain, I don't care if it's Mickey Mouse in that box. All I know is that some crackpot collector is paying me three million bucks for whatever is inside the coffin, not the coffin itself. The captain's eyebrows rose. A collector, you say? Ah, uh, but the ship's manifest says its destination is the Museum of Natural History, so it cannot be. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mala said with mounting impatience. It's supposed to go to the museum for authentication first. Captain, I really don't see you having any choice in the matter. Kindly lead me to the cargo, or... He left the rest of the sentence unfinished. Captain Lu Wan was a man who took his responsibilities seriously. The safety of his cargo was as important to him as the safety of his crew, and so he forgot himself when he answered. No, I cannot do that. Pity. The war pack leader looked surprised, then disappointed. For a crazy moment, Captain Lu Wan thought the man and his gang of hoodlums would simply storm off the ship in a sulk. But Malice had something else in mind. He searched the eyes of the captives kneeling before him, looking for the one who looked most frightened. It happened to be the youngest of the crew, the 19-year-old ship's mate. Malice pointed at the young man, his fingers playfully making a pistol shape. Bang! He said, Without hesitation, one of the armed men shot the youth in the back of the head, spraying blood and bits of brain everywhere. The screams began. Oh, God! Li Ming! No! The captain shouted. You bastards! You killed my nephew! He was just a kid! Just a kid! Shut up! Shut up! Malice violently backslapped the captain's face to remind him who was in charge. Shall I pick another captain, or will you give me what I want? The captain rubbed his face. The sting of the slap brought the full horror of the situation into a clearer light. All right. He said, getting up from his knees. He held back his tears for his murdered nephew. There was still the lives of his remaining crew at stake. He had been foolish to resist. Malice followed Captain Lu Wan into the darker part of the cargo hold, turning briefly to give his men an order. Stay here. Keep an eye on the crew. Anyone moves, shoot them. Mayhem, follow me. His accomplice, a very large-built, muscular young man with a disconcerting permanent smile on his face, joined the two, leaving the other eight mercenaries to keep their glocks trained on the terrified crew. Captain Lu Wan ushered Malice and Mayhem into the walk-in security vault at the far end of the hold. 
It was here where especially valuable and highly insured freight were stored for the duration of the voyage. With a surprisingly steady hand, the captain punched in the access code on the wall-mounted keypad. The huge steel doors opened with the hissing pressure of working hydraulics. The vault held only one item, a wooden crate the size and shape of a coffin. Malice's eyes widened as he gazed at the prize that would make him and his team of mercenaries three million dollars richer. Open it, Captain. He ordered. Captain Lu Wan nodded, grabbed the mallet and chisel hanging on the wall, and went to work on the crate. As he pried the lid open, uprooting the nails that secured the top of the crate, he prayed he wouldn't disturb the spirit within. Not that he believed for a moment in the demonic powers of the warlord sage, or even that it was the warlord sage. But in his culture, the dead were to be honored, and disturbing their spirits was bad luck. Once the lid of the crate was removed, the stone coffin was revealed. It was cold-looking, a deep slate gray, yet elegant in design, with ancient Chinese characters boldly chiseled on the coffin lid. Impressive. Malice commented as he looked at the ancient encasement. Open it. But something on the coffin lid held the captain frozen to the spot. He read the ancient words, he blinked, and he read them again. A dim memory surfaced, a child screaming in the darkness, a grandfather stroking his hair as he murmured, Hush, hush, Sprout. Captain Lu Wan felt the terror once again. It says, he said in a tremulous voice, that a curse will befall anyone who disturbs the spirit of the warlord sage. I don't care if it says don't open till Christmas. I said open it. Mayhem, you help him. The two men did as they were told. The stone coffin lid made a terrible grinding noise as they lifted it, signifying how heavy and thick it was. It was also much heavier than they had realized and made a deafening noise when they half dropped it to the metal floor of the deck. Malice stepped forward and peered inside the stone casing. Oh, now that is fantastic. He purred. The remains of the warlord sage were mainly skeletal with little or no remaining flesh at all. The decapitated skull rested atop the chest area attached with an ancient but well-preserved leather strap. The robes were tattered shreds now, its once brilliant colors long ago faded into a coffin gray that matched the burial casing. As the men took it all in, the dank, stale smell of centuries-old air and human rot wafted into their nostrils. Malice did not notice the smell. It was rather the sword known as the Soul Taker that held his attention. It was sheathed, the handle obscured by the skeletal hands that rested in repose upon it. Get the sword, Malice ordered. Mayhem hesitated for a second, not wanting to touch such a disgusting heap of rotted flesh and bones, but he reminded himself that one had to get dirty sometimes, figuratively as well as literally, so he reached for the ancient weapon. He could not pick it up, not so easily. It seemed to be locked into the warlord's hands. As Malice looked on impatiently, Mayhem tried to pry the hands apart, a harder job than he would have imagined. Finally freeing the sword only after breaking a few bones, the crackling sound they made gave him a slight case of goosebumps, but only slight. God knows he had broken many bones before. Once the sword was freed from the dead warlord's grip, Mayhem unsheathed it to reveal the weapon in all its glory. It was of standard battle length forged of black metal, symbols or ancient writing, Malice did not know which, nor did he care, were etched on the handle, surrounding a highly artistic green and gold intertwining vine design with a dragon's mouth that bit at the hilt. The blade itself was unusually wide, narrowing only near the tip, but its most striking feature was a flat, clear crystal set in the middle of the blade itself. It was strange and magnificent, Mayhem thought. It was a weapon that demanded respect. Captain Lu Wan had been watching all this with a rage that built up inside him and threatened to snap. He no longer saw the thieves with the sword. He no longer saw an ancient remains of a childhood horror story come true. He only saw his nephew being shot over and over again like a nightmarish film loop played before his eyes. Then he heard a calm voice, as clear as if it whispered into his ear. They killed your nephew, Lee Ming. They deserve to pay. They deserve to die. Startled, the captain jerked his head to look behind him, but there was no one else here, not in this part of the cargo hold. Take the sword and drive it into their hearts. The voice went on in a louder, more insistent whisper. Make them pay with their lives for what they have done. The disembodied voice had the effect of calming the captain. It was a voice to be honored, to be obeyed. Yes. 
Yes, you are right. The captain whispered back. I must avenge the death of Li Ming. I will kill them. I am going to kill them all. He approached the two men with a vengeful gleam in his eyes. Malice was preparing to place the sword into a narrow duffel bag, but it was Mayhem who noticed the sudden movement from behind. The captain jumped towards the two men with a fury and speed of a wild animal. In the same movement, he bit the arm of Malice, who screamed out in pain and dropped the sword. Mayhem moved quickly, pulling out his Glock and shooting the captain. Lu Wan had unexpectedly bent over to pick up the sword and received only a glancing wound on his shoulder. Now the captain's vengeful eyes turned on Mayhem. Mayhem fired another bullet into his right knee. Like a marionette that had one vital string cut out, Captain Lu Wan collapsed to the floor, but that did not deter him from reaching for the sword. But Malice snatched it up before he could reach it. Give me the sword so that I may kill you with it. Lu Wan said in a voice that sounded strangely doubled, as if the two were speaking at once. One voice the captain's, the other voice strange and sinister. Mayhem backed up with surprise. This was something that he was not expecting. This was becoming a bit scary, even for him. Malice took out his pistol to shoot the deranged captain and finish him off, but then stopped. He slowly put the gun back in the holster, and then approached the captain with the sword in his hand. You want this sword so badly, don't you? Then I'll give it to you right here. He said as he swung the sword across the captain's neck. The slicing was so perfect that there was no blood spatter at all. The captain's head slid off his neck slowly and then rolled to the floor. Then came the blood, a thick, gurgling pool that seemed to boil over his neck and shoulders. This sword is wicked. Oh, I do like this, Malice said with a childlike glee. He examined it more closely. Before his startled eyes, the weapon started to glow red. He noticed something else, a pulsating and neon bright blue light that seemed to emanate from the captain's decapitated body. What the hell? He said. The two mercenaries watched spellbound as the strange light drifted from the headless body into the glowing red blade of the sword. Malice felt a strange surge of energy coming from the direction of the captain. He dropped the sword, the clatter echoing through the cargo hold. Mayhem laughed incredulously, a laugh of fear. Man, I'm out of here. I've seen enough. That thing is cursed. With a final shudder, he rushed out of the security cargo hold, but Malice stayed, his greed clouding his judgment.